Uh, hello, Mr. Seffling from, he's based in San Diego. Uh, good, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening. Robert Schofling. I am the Vice President, uh, International Strategic Developments for General Atomics. And what I'll be talking about today is ASW, but it's hard to talk about ASW without talking a little bit about where we've been in the past. So it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you this morning, my side, this evening, your side. Uh, a little of my background is spent 25 years in the U.S. Navy flying P-3s, mission commander. Uh, the majority of that time was hunting submarines. I spent 12 years at the Boeing Company working on the P-8A Poseidon, and I've been at General Atomics for the last four years. So jumping right into anti-submarine warfare, I'll start with the tagline. ASW is hard. And it's hard because it's challenging. And it's always been challenging. New submarines are quieter. They're using new tactics, new techniques, and new procedures. To be successful, you've got to be fast to get the datum. You've got to have a persistent response. You've got to have better sensors. And ASW really requires that you know your environment. When you're chasing submarines, the person that knows the environment the best is the skipper of the submarine. They know how to use that environment to their advantage, how to hide underneath the sonic layer depth um, or where to put themselves so that they're hard to exploit. And you know, going off the MH60 Romeo, ASW is always easier if you have cooperative prosecutions. So getting as many assets and as many sensors onto that ASW target uh, is going to give you a better chance for success. So I put an equation in front of you. Everybody that's ever done ASW knows this equation. Uh, now, we're not going to do math today, but I am going to talk about this equation because this is an equation that's been around for decades, but it really points us to where we need to go in the future to be successful at ASW. The equation that you're seeing is the signal excess. If you've got a positive value in there, then the submarine is being exposed and you can detect him. Uh, the SL, that's the source level of the submarine. That's the part that's getting quieter and quieter all the time. You've got ambient noise in the environment, whether it's from waves, whether it's from sea creatures, uh, whether it's from other ships. And the more populated the surface of the ocean gets, the louder the ambient noise gets. Propagation loss. When that ray path is traveling through the water, and water is a great medium uh, to detect sound because it travels a long distance, but it does get weaker and weaker over time. Recognition, recognition differential is can we discern that that's a sub? And I'll talk about this a little bit more. And the directivity index allows us to focus our sensors in a certain area while blanking or nulling other areas uh, to maybe get rid of some of that ambient noise. So this is an old equation, but if you stick with me for a moment, I'll show you how it can, can guide new investments. So the source level, uh, in the 60s, submarines were very loud. Uh, they were uh, using uh, convergence zone tracking, where sound would travel uh, first CZ 30 miles or second ZZ 60 miles. And you could stand off uh, tens of miles from the submarine and be able to track it. That's not the case anymore. Uh, sound dampening really began uh, in the US and in other countries in the 70s and 90s. Uh, diesel uh, engines uh, became quiet because they didn't have to use them as much. Uh, some of these, they didn't have to snorkel as much. They didn't have to put a snorkel on the surface of water uh, to get the air in. So now they use what's called air independent propulsion, um, which makes them harder to detect. Uh, and they're running off batteries most of the time for the diesel submarines. And batteries have never been loud. But Modern submarines, both diesel and nuclear, are very, very quiet in all the environments. And I'm focusing on the acoustic environment, the sound underwater this morning. But 
the electromagnetic uh, environment. Uh, they well versed submarine crews put up their masts for communication or for do a radar sweep or to put their periscope up. They do it less and less and less because the submarine, the submariners are better trained in their tactics and techniques. Ambient noise, it's rising worldwide, whether it's biologics, geologics, storms, or man-made, global shipping, gas, oil, exploration. Propagation loss, this is the same physics that have been around for time. But the better we understand that propagation, the better we can model how that sound travels underwater is, leads to the better exploitation of it. And it also points us to how we maximize our sensor design and employment. Um, so you've got to exploit that propagation path. You've got to exploit that water column as in the airborne ASW because the submariner is. So you're really uh, battling your wits against theirs. Recognition differential, there's manual recognition. A ASW operator takes years and years to train and the proficiency to stay good at this is something that has to be practiced over and over again. And when you're flying on an airplane or when you're flying on a helicopter, people get tired during those long missions. And as they get tired, their recognition differential decreases. Now, some ways that we can counter that, um, as I'll show you in a little bit, um, you can take them out of the airplane environment and they're gonna be less tired, less fatigued. And you can also employ automation, um, artificial intelligence more and more to help you detect that summary. Uh, the last part of this equation is the directivity index. That's our ability to directionally steer the sauna buoy gain and blank out some of the noise. And that's probably one of the most effective ways to mitigate a loud environment. But guess what? There's something missing in this equation. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about it in one second, but this is where you invest. You invest in decreasing the ambient noise, uh, exploiting the propagation loss, increasing the recognition differential, and increasing the directivity index. That investment is gonna directly improve your performance. But now what's missing out of that equation is time. It's missing time because persistence over that target area always wins. In all ASW engagements in the past, in all ASWs modeling and simulation, the platform or the sensors that you can put over that target the longest, the better chance you're gonna have of, while searching, that you locate and you track, and if need be, you attack that summary. So with time as the focus of this equation, let me show you one of the ways uh, that General Atomics is helping to add that time aspect to the equation to really help us exploit those four, the ambient noise, the prop loss, the recognition differential, and the directivity index. So airplanes aren't the only source of persistent monitoring. Uh, the US has employed uh, SIRTAS ships and SOSIS arrays for years and years and years. These SOSIS arrays are fixed arrays on the bottom and those, those signals are sent right to the a Naval, Naval Oceanographic Processing Facility where there's somebody looking at this around the clock. Now these are very strategic sensors. They can tell you that there's a submarine out there and they can give you a smaller area of probability of where the submarine is, but to actually localize, track, and attack that submarine, you need another asset out there, whether it's a ship, whether it's a helicopter, or whether it's a fixed-wing wing aircraft. You know, the MQ-9B, which I'll talk about in the rest of this presentation, is just that sort of platform that solves the time aspect of that equation. It's an airplane that's gonna go beyond station 
depending on how many sauna buoys is carrying, depending on how it's configured, it's going to be out there for 20 to 30 hours. And when you're out there for 20 to 30 hours, you're, you're going to be closer to where that datum shows up, where the submarine is. You're going to have a smaller area to search because you've already been looking at the same area for hours and hours and hours. It's hard for the submarine to outweigh the airplane on uh, helicopters, on P3s, on P8s, you know, some of the modern uh, airborne ASW platforms, they're only out there for a limited amount of time. Uh, the helicopter only has a certain radius and a certain amount of time it can fly. Uh, the P8 uh, was designed, one of its most important requirements was to be able to fly 1200 miles, stay on station for four hours, and then return that 1200 miles. Uh, the P3 is not that different in terms of its endurance and its ability to stay on station. Also, if you've got one airplane, an unmanned aerial system out there, there's fewer turnovers. Oftentimes, submarine contact will be lost as one airplane's transitioning in and the other airplane is transitioning out. Just another reason why ASW is hard. And that persistence bridges the gaps between other sensors. So the tagline is persistent presence wins ASW. So at General Atomics, we're already there. We have demonstrated anti-submarine warfare from our MQ-9 aircraft. We have integrated a uh, sonic buoy management system of an of a, a acoustic receiver, acoustic processor, uh, cast transmitter onto the airplane. And we have developed pods that actually carry sonic buoys out to the datum, whether it's 100 miles away or whether it's 1,000 miles away. And these airplanes have the ability to stay on station uh, for that time. Now, what you're seeing on the upper right of my screen is a gram of us, us tracking an underwater target. And what you're seeing on the bottom right of the screen is the tactical picture of the sauna buoys in contact with that underwater target. And I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that. But the main picture you see is our very first sauna buoy deployment. And you can see the sauna buoy coming out, the parachute opening, the uh, sauna launch container cap coming off, and the wind flap coming off. And these are important to us because this is a pusher prop type airplane. So this sauna buoy dispenser was designed to eject the sauna buoy out and away from the airplane. And we've demonstrated this uh, in cooperation with the U.S. Navy. Uh, we had a, a CRADA, a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement with the U.S. Navy to help develop this technology. And we've proved it off our uh, Southern California ranges. And we proved it while working with P-8s and working with MH-60s uh, during an integrated battle problem last year. And we're getting ready to go out to RIMPAC this year to do much of the same. So we've done a lot of discussion about tracking, finding tracking submarines using their uh, sound from those submarines. But there's a lot of other ways, there's a lot of other tools in the toolbox to do anti-submarine warfare. What you're seeing here is a fully configured MQ-9B Sea Guardian in the ASW and maritime configuration. It consists of a 360 degree maritime patrol radar. So if that submarine pops up a mast or it pops up a periscope, periscope, it's got a small detection capability, periscope detection capability that will help find that. We've got a state-of-the-art uh, Westcam MX-20 or Raytheon MTSD 20-inch EOIR camera. So if you're looking for the hot spots or you're following a wake and seeing where it takes you, you've got that EOIR capability. I've mentioned the sauna buoy dispenser. The airplane will carry four sauna buoy dispensers. And in those sauna buoy dispensers will either be 40 A-size 
sauna briefs or 80 G size sauna briefs, which is sufficient to search, localize, track, and develop an attack solution or vector another platform in for the attack solution. You've got ESM and ELINT on the airplane. So if that submarine does pop up and it does radiate, you're going to get that signal and it's going to give you a line of bearing of where to go search for that submarine. Or if that submarine pops up and it communicates, there's communications intelligence, comment systems on the airplane. Historically, 60 to 70% of all submarine detections are when they're on the surface, when they've got a mast above the water, when they've got a periscope above of the water. So you need these other tools in your toolbox and you need that persistence. So if you're going to outweigh the submarine, you need to be out there for those 20 to 30 hours. What's also on this airplane, and we talked about it in the last presentation, is it has Link 16. When we're performing an integrated battle problem, we had Link 16 connection with the P8s, we had Link 16 connections with the destroyers. So as we're developing the ASW problem and we're looking at a sauna buoy and we're saying it's up Doppler or it's down Doppler and here's the F sub zero, F sub one or F sub two, we're actually on a secure chat line with the P8. So our operators in the ground control station are chatting in real time with the P8 and they're developing that ASW solution together. It's also a weapons ready platform it's got nine hard points and the ability to carry all modern weaponry on it. The way we do it is we do it via SATCOM, either KU or KA or X-Band. We've got a ground control station that could be 100 miles away or it could be 1,000 miles away or it could be on the other side of the world. And we're communicating with the MQ-9 in real time. There's about a one second latency uh, between what happens on the airplane and what is seen in the ground control station. But we do both uh, on the surface, below the surface and over land uh, surveillance. So it's truly a multi-domain uh, aircraft. Um, so you'll have uh, from the ground control station, you'll have surface tracks and you'll have subsurface tracks. And you'll be sending your Link 16 tracks, your radar, your EOIR, your AIS, um, all goes through the SATCOM. And we've got the bandwidth through that SATCOM that the sensor operators can see all those sensors simultaneously. So while we're doing the acoustic plot, we're also looking at our radar picture. We're also looking at our EOIR picture. We're also listening for that communications intelligence. And we're also searching uh, the ESM spectrum from zero to 40 gigahertz. So the ground control station, I mentioned, I mentioned recognition differential as one of the features in that sonar equation. When you've got an acoustic operator and he's sitting at a desk, at a desk in a fixed location, he's not suffering from the fatigue that it would be if he's uh, on a ship or on a helicopter or on a P-8. He's in a very controlled environment. And the fact that this ground control station is land-based, we have connection feeds to everything. So we could be prosecuting an ASW problem at this ground control station and simultaneously have somebody hundreds or thousands of miles looking at the same signals we are, the same information we are, or we can put out reports. We don't have to wait till we land to put out reports. So everything is not only real time in the ground control station, but it's real time anywhere you want it to be. If you want to have that picture on the Admiral's desk, real time, he can be watching what that airplane is doing from the comfort of his desk or from the comfort of his cell phone. So it really, you take the data and the data uh, becomes intelligence, and that intelligence becomes knowledge, 
and that knowledge enables the decision makers to make the decisions uh, they need to do. So I'm gonna show you a short video and then I will uh, stand by if there are any questions. So I'll close with having flown for 25 years on P3s hunting submarines, having worked at the Boeing company, designing, building, and selling the P8s, and having worked at General Atomics. This capability to not only launch sauna buoys, but to look at the surface of the water, it's not evolutionary in terms of maritime surveillance and ASW. It's truly revolutionary. Thank you.